TBO One was released around this time in 2020, celebrating its second birthday now out in the wild. So it seemed like a good opportunity to delve into the mighty little machine and its origins. And for that, we need to talk to the founder of Erica Since and the mastermind behind the DBO one and that's Gets. Hi, Richard. Thank you for having me. Uh, pleasure. So can you tell us sort of moment that the idea for this machine came along? See, until then, uh, we mostly had, uh, had uh, Eurorack modules and uh, except uh, except fusion box and uh, acid box which were standalone uh, fx units but uh, by making eurorack modules we accumulated so much uh, know-how in uh, analog circuit design and also in some digital um, circuits as well and we had some sequencers already in place but um, and then we realized that, well, we need uh, a standalone unit. And uh, as uh, my colleague Kodak, he does exclusively live performances without any preparation whatsoever. So entire our uh, design philosophy is to have instruments that are playable, like in live performances, that are fun to play and so on. So we started development of uh, acid baseline uh, monosynth um, basically based on our baseline uh, Eurorack module. So analog circuit is pretty much similar like on a module, but, uh, but yeah, we wanted to have this desktop unit. So decided to add a sequencer and we wanted a sequencer that is uh, performance oriented and uh, very straightforward to use. So that was actually kind of uh, creative brief for the uh, for the instrument, and yeah, that development started. Yeah, because the the sequencer seems to be a, a very much uh, integral part of the machine, doesn't it? I mean, you take away the sequencer, and it's like you're taking away. Um, sort of half the character of the machine in a way because you know you add accents filter modulation pitch envelope and there's so much that of the sound that sort of comes from the sequencer itself isn't there yeah exactly and uh you know it's uh in that sense uh for uh, external hardware sequencers they are uh they are just uh they do even the best ones, take Circlin, for instance, <laughs> they do their thing, but uh, without uh, deep integration with a synthesizer, which is a case with uh, um, baseline uh, DBO1, uh, it cannot reveal its true potential. And basically, basically like the instrument is complete only when it, uh, when all parts and the talk to each other in the right way and um, yeah so um, so therefore you cannot just simply take Eurorack uh, uh, baseline as a voice and uh, some Eurorack sequencer and just merge them in one uh, box you know, they, they, that will never work you need this uh, deeper integration which we bring, by the way, to the next level with uh, Perkun's drum machine. Which I'd love to talk about, but maybe next time. Yeah, next time, <laughs> next time. <laughs> so did, uh, did the design evolve? See, um, <clears throat> we typically start with, uh, when we start designing an instrument, we typically start with the user interface and uh, we lay out how uh, the instrument will look like it. It uh, same as with the Eurorack module or with the um, baseline or uh, later LXR or um, other instruments. So it's basically based on uh, initial intention, what the instrument has to do. We lay out controls and we uh, we we 
consider how user interface will look like. And just then we start uh, circuit design and, uh, and uh, other processes. So basically the baseline uh, does not differ much from uh, initial sketches on a uh, on piece of paper, you know, how, how it actually turned out uh, at the end. So maybe we did some review, I do not recall that uh, uh, we did some revision of, uh, of uh, potential control spaces, space placement slightly, because we, we never rely on 3D, and, uh, 3D uh, uh, renderings, you know, that's, I know some companies that do 3D renderings. Well, it looks so nice, and then let's make it. So we actually better invest in hardware prototype, even its mock-up, with all controls laid out, and then we try how it feels. And uh, and that's first. It's very motivating that you already have it on a table. <laughs> Another thing is uh, you actually get how it feels. You know, our potentiometer spaced uh, correctly. Can I access all controls like um, straight away and so on and so on. So Does the filter uh, knob need to be bigger? Yeah, exactly, exactly. Yeah. <laughs> and it has to be like super uh, reliable. <laughs> it reads that filter knob. Like maybe you heard the uh, Moog recalled some, uh, some uh, instruments because uh, filter knob was too loose and it just wore out <laughs> yeah <laughs> that's right i think to... that was uh sub 37 the original yes, sub yes, 30. yes 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 yeah and uh yeah so i'm i come from advertising background and my colleagues like kodak is a professional musician and uh, we know how to stick to the brief and how to we try to avoid those sidesteps that well, would be nice to have also that one and then maybe let's put it there, something else, you know. And so we just, if we add something that, we add something that makes sense, you know. And also form factor, yeah. It, uh, I'm not sure how we ended up with this uh, form factor. Maybe it was, we wanted something that is uh, close to our, uh, Acid box mm, uh, desktop version, but uh, yeah, it's actually dimensions are pretty much similar, but uh, we made it a little bit wider yeah, because of sequencer. Is that why the volume knob didn't get a didn't get a look in? That's what some people ask sometimes. Why doesn't get a where's the volume knob? It's uh, hidden in menu. <laughs> that was uh, that was a feature we added afterwards, actually. Yes, um, but. Uh, you know, for instrument like that, uh, why would you generally need this volume knob? Because anyway, you connect it to the mixer or desk and uh, you can adjust volume there. You know? so, yeah. yeah, yeah. But uh, yeah, that's... See, uh, Napoleon said that uh, uh, in the uh, essence of strategy is sacrifice. So, and uh, the brightest examples are, for instance, uh, this... Uh, U2 reconnaissance plane. When it took off, uh, chassis uh, like felt off. So because they wanted to make it as light as possible, so it landed actually on two wheels, and uh, and there were crew that catched it uh, by wings <laughs> because it could it it was not stable anymore when it landed. <laughs> so because they they want they made conscious decision to sacrifice. Uh, chassis you know after it takes off because it has to be light <laughs> and that's a brief you know if it has to be right uh, light has to be fast therefore we need to save on what we do not need up there you know <laughs> dbo one is very focused instrument so it it does what it has to do <laughs> and uh, there is honestly not much space for experimentation you know like take Syntrex and you can experiment with it like for years, you know, you can spend your retirement time, you know. <laughs> what I feel is uh, my strength, you know, that uh, really I can focus and I can, uh, I can um, make things uh, happen and make things happen as they are intended 
like uh, yeah, resisting temptations to to overload the interface with with uh, features like secondary maybe or, you know which overcomplicate interaction with the instrument for instance and therefore we wanted to revolu revolutionize uh, sequencers because kind of conventional wisdom of baseline sequencers is a 303 sequencer mm, which is honestly not uh, the easiest sequencer to use especially you know when playing live you, you have to put some specific efforts to get results and so with baseline uh, we somehow wanted to change this uh, mm, convention let's put it that way that's uh, how the way how pe people think about sequencers and uh, do it our way and uh, i believe we kind of succeeded yeah some of the um especially some of the early comparisons were perhaps naturally enough with the 303 was was that an an inspiration or or was it sort of where well, we don't want to do things the way that that was or um, 303 is a uh, obvious inspiration uh, in terms of application of the machine. So yeah, it does create, a, uh, primarily it's intended to create acid baselines and this Polyvox filter which is inside uh, uh, our baseline synthesizer. So it, it's brilliant at that. <laughs> there is no this volume drop when resonance is increased and it screams, as, it can scream as crazy. <laughs> and uh, yeah, but um, yeah, we wanted two envelopes, uh, which again uh, open up much more possibilities. So we wanted noise generator, which again uh, can go into very like dirty territory and uh, and yeah, you can create uh, uh, percussion percussive sounds as well and then we uh, added this pitch envelope which again does uh, like brings a uh, kind of regular bus line synthesizer to more experimental territory which we <laughs> just discussed yeah. yeah actually the the pitch envelope there now to my ears um, some of the DBO one pitch envelope sounds just sounds a, a little bit like some of the sounds I've heard out of the Perklins. Is that uh, you know? Is there any any crossover at all between those? The no, 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 no. Oh, okay, I'm imagining yeah, it. Both, you know, both, uh, both the instruments have. Uh, uh, that's one of algorithms on Perklins, which is uh, you know, modulating uh, oscillator with a pitch envelope and adding some uh, some click you know in um, in a very very initial moment of the when it, when trigger hits but uh, but uh, yeah that's pure coincidence they're uh, completely different in instruments and uh, you know, simply algorithm is kind of similar and what about the drive circuit and the DBO one was that modeled on anything in particular? That's uh, we use the same circuit on a, on a baseline module, and that's actually quite uh, straightforward diode overdrive. But what we did, uh, we uh, how the drive is introduced. It's actually it crossfades uh, between. Uh, uh, dry signal and overdrive signal so that's a different way how to how you introduce drive in mix you know rather than uh, just overdriving uh, uh, signal you have we have uh, phosphate between uh, and there are actually two signal that the signal is split in two parts so one is dry signal and other is overdriven signal so, but uh, drive circuit itself it's just uh, two diodes in a uh, feedback loop <laughs> of the op -amp. yeah so it's very obvious yeah. One. yeah were there any uh, were there any happy accidents along the way any little things that you went oh well wasn't expecting that but let's keep it um we did not expect that uh, pitch envelope will make uh, so great percussion sounds basically yeah when i 
first, or that was one of first times we showed uh, our baseline to public was uh, a workshop or uh, or what, presentation in Perfect Circuit Audio uh, in LA. So I played a uh, 15-minute set uh, solely on two baselines, synthesizers, you know, and um, and one was uh, just for percussions, and uh, other was like baseline, baseline. And uh, yeah, that was uh, that was very gratifying when you when developing, you figure out that well, it's more than you expected. <laughs> And the uh, one of the other things that uh, sometimes people sort of say is, oh, I'm, you know, no, there's no presets. Is that something that you think is part of the philosophy of an instrument to include the ability to have presets or is it more just a sort of technical cost equation of whether it can be included or not? The... Uh... Uh, we have uh, on our website we have this uh, garage project which is actually one of those live streams uh, from uh, our office so we actually have uh, haven't had uh, a stream for a year because we are now in temporary office we are building new one but uh, other thing is we have uh, conversations with uh, with uh, musicians in, uh, in electronic music so I have had quite few conversations with like top artists and so on. And uh, also, if you read Future Music magazine, for instance, uh, those interviews with how it's made, you know. <laughs> and uh, when I ask, what's your favorite synthesizer? I do not recall any person naming favorite synthesizer being one with presets. <laughs> They all come back to to early analog synthesizers, which uh, has way less presets than a uh, baseline does. You know, because in baseline you still can save uh, save patterns. You know, you can save uh, actual baselines. Yeah, but yeah, but um, it's a live performance instrument, and that's um, that's a main intention. You know, that you you play the instrument and you have you master the instrument you know your guitar doesn't have presets as well you know when it was in development how did you actually test the sound did you take um, you know like a, a prototype along to a, a club or put it through a pa or how do you actually decide that you've sort of nailed that bass sound that you wanted oh, we have a privilege uh of uh, building prototypes because we have uh, like over 100 different Eurorack modules. So we basically can, can put together quite extensive system uh, that emulates like really crazy instruments. <laughs> and um, and uh, that's uh, initial uh, way how we test uh, uh, feasibility of the instrument. So, is it worth developing, you know, at all, <laughs> in first place? I mean, and um, and um, that thing, and uh, other that we have in our uh, older off or previous office, uh, we had uh, this performance room, which was room like uh, two meters times uh, four meters or something, and we had uh, two kilowatt speakers there. So, so he could bring any instrument downstairs and uh, and test it on sound system, which is uh, uh, better than in most of club you know, clubs. Uh, so yeah, so yeah, that's uh, that's a definite test that uh, yeah you have to bring instrument to venue where you can play it really loud. You know? Uh, I have now I have privilege I have speakers over there you know which are uh, almost uh, as tall as I am <laughs> so it's at my place <laughs> and um, and I can test any instrument you know like bring it to extremes like there's a threshold of painful hearing <laughs> And they're still at very perfect quality because they have like 
extremely good response. You've said in the past that um, you know Latvia has some of the best infrastructure for manufacturing in the world, and uh, you know given all the many problems in the world today to do with manufacturing, um, how much is the DBO one built in Latvia, and is it sort of immune from many of the problems that are uh, hitting a lot of synth makers these days? World economics, you know, the, the, it has involved, you know, and uh, even though you you consider yourself a you know, local tea company, which I'm not talking about us, but you still buy ingredients uh, from uh, like other countries, so it's almost impossible to have self contained economy but uh, to answer your question every uh, like a uh, baseline uh, synthesizer and actually same as all our instruments they're 100 percent built in latvia but of course we we depend on uh, semiconductor and uh, passive component supplies because there are no uh, such uh, manufacturing in uh, latvia and uh, and in european union as far as now um so um we have uh, certain problems uh, lucky for us we have a uh, uh, factory alpha who actually makes baseline uh, synthesizer um, and they uh, inspired by us they started development of contemporary versions of uh, cm chips so they have over 20 different musical instruments applications specific chips so we have privilege to use uh, partly made in Latvia VCO chips, uh, uh, Polyvox filter op-amps uh, also are made in Latvia, and so on and so on. Uh, now the problem is uh, BBD chips, because um, Cool Audio stopped making them, or they simply do not come back with, uh, with uh, any reasonable uh, lead times for uh, for product and so, but uh, Alf has developed uh, their own uh, BBD, which has uh, much more uh, uh, dynamic uh, range and so. So we are forced to change certain modules and uh, including also a baseline to um, to replace components from China to locally uh, sourced. So, um, yeah, there will be some design changes, but uh, that will just uh, uh, reflect beneficial, beneficially for uh, sound and end result. Yeah. Well, speaking yeah. of that, uh, there's always, um, I think with machines, there's, there's pressure sometimes from, well, maybe some users or potential users sort of saying, oh, well, you know, wouldn't it be great if it had this or wouldn't it be great if it had that? You know, is there going to be a Mark II with something or a Mark III with something? Um, but against that, I suppose, is the idea that the machine is released in a certain form and, and goes on for, you know, perhaps many years and, and evolves that classic reputation. Um, where do you think the DBO one falls in that? In in that form, uh, there is nothing much to add. You know, and what what uh, we have introduced some uh, some nice features in uh, in uh, firmware, uh, but uh, but uh, I do not see that uh, we will have like Mark II with a uh, radically different uh, interface or some we have uh, other products uh, in development and uh, those are, this is priority at the moment so we want yeah we see uh, this is uh, as complete instrument of course as i mentioned before we will change uh, bbd circuit there because um, uh, we'll have better ones and um, and uh, I hope uh, we will still have uh, microcontrollers uh, that are exactly the same we use here, but otherwise we will design also, uh, redesign also um, 
microcontroller uh, uh, circuit to accommodate ones which are available. But yeah, what uh, Erika Synth stands for always is that uh, our all, all our instruments are available straight away. Except, of course, for a few very new ones or just released ones. Um, but uh, but uh, we are really working hard to have everything in stock and you know, we can ship it same day. You know. Excellent. Well, he's looking forward to uh, many more birthdays for the DB01. And uh, yeah. thanks very much for spending the time today. Yeah, thank you.